bless your holy name, Jesus. Praise you for your goodness, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. His presence is in this place in an awesome way this morning. He is so good. He is so kind. I'd like to welcome all of you that are watching by way of streaming on the website. We welcome you this morning. We pray that the service here will bless your life in an eternal way. Get your Bibles, we're going to go right to today's lesson. We honor the Lord for all of you today. Thank you, Jesus. Get your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel. To the book of 1 Samuel. And then get me some tissue, please. We're on our way on a journey we will be tapping into and reminding you if this is not your first time here for all the sons and daughters of Global Destiny that we are preparing ourselves to know how to pray, where to pray, and when to pray. We do know that men ought to always pray and not faint. We do know that the Bible and the Lord requires us as believers that we would always pray and not faint because it is in prayer that everything changes everything and anything changes through prayer nothing remains the same nothing stays the same nothing can be the same and you are recognized and respected by the enemy when you are a person that have dedicated your life to the obedience of the office of prayer it is just as much of an office as preaching and praying and prophesying and, 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 and singing. And I tell you, when you find people that are committed to the office of prayer, it changes your life forever. We were trying to go and look at, and what we have been looking at is the purpose as to the reason why the believer is called to the temple to pray. Why do we come to church to pray why are we you know people say well i can pray at home absolutely i can pray in my car you absolutely can but i believe that uh, there is and being proven it through the word of god through our studies in the last few weeks we are seeing the power of the temple prayer we are seeing the power of the prayer that takes place and the results that you get when you make the sacrifice the key word here is sacrifice and we've been laying into that and we're going to continue to lay into that because it is the person and the individual that understands the power of the sacrifice that gets God's attention amen somebody down through the history of the scripture when you look at the phenomenal miracles and when you look at the things that the Lord has done in the Old Testament it was done by people who made the sacrifice Come on, somebody. You look at Abraham uh, after praying for so many years that God would give him an heir. And the Lord finally gave him Isaac. And he was his only son. But he chose to march up and make him and offer him a sacrifice. And it was in that sacrifice that he was, that he was willing to give up one son and became and received a supernatural anointing from God to be the father of many nations. That as the sand, as the, as the, as the kernels are on the sand, you will never be able to count your spiritual children. Come on, somebody. Because he made the sacrifice. The sacrifice when he walked up and said, this is my only, and this is the one that I've been praying that the Lord would give me, but yet... I have found something in my spirit that says I still want to give it to God. Amen, somebody. Bring him right up here. Pastor Hogue and his wife, bring them right up this way, please. Thank you. 
Put your hands together for the men of God this morning. Powerful men of God. So good to see you. So good to see you. So good to see you. It's a very special morning today, and we'll tell you about that later. But I believe that the Lord picked out during my time of prayer this next person that He wants us to study because what He's given us is patterns. A prayer how many remember me saying that we don't we don't we don't want to just be in prayer and just you know just fumbling our way and and we want to be able to have methods and patterns uh, that we can count on um, as a structure and then if the Holy Spirit leads you you know with the, if, the, if the Spirit of God takes you out in a realm you start it from a base that the Lord has laid so you're not starting out in prayer, just, oh God, oh thank you, oh Lord, and help me, and, and, and then, and, and Jesus, and ooh, it, 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 you, you can't get anywhere like that. And, and some of you all laugh because you just say in my bag, because that's just me right there. As soon as you go in and pray, oh God, and, and Jesus, and you know, and you know Father, and, and, uh, and, and, and oh, ooh. you just keep going to the Lord, just have mercy on you, and you just tap the rim, but you didn't spend 20 minutes in foolishness. You got nothing done. Man, somebody. So we know that we enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. We start out by praising God. We start out by blessing God. The Bible said, he that come unto God must come believing that he is. That he is a rewarder to them that diligently seek him. Then you begin to tell God who you believe him to be. Because there ain't no sense in you asking him for something if you don't believe him to be that. You confirm to him that you trust who he is. And you already, before you even be, bring your petition before him, I know your ability. I know your strength, God. I know what you have the power to accomplish. So let me tell you already, you're Jehovah Jireh, because I'm getting ready to ask you to pay my rent. Oh, come on, somebody. Amen, somebody. I'm getting ready to tell you I don't have this card note right here. So let me tell you that you are that. And I'm depending on you to be that. Amen, somebody. So when you go about, amen, so when you go about knowing who the Lord is, then we're understanding the power of temple prayer. What, what, what happens when a person prays in the temple, uh, in opposed to, why are we called as a collective body at some period of time during the week, during the month, during the year, to come into the temple? When we look at uh, uh, Hannah in the first chapter of the book of Samuel, and I want, uh, the first thing that I want you to notice and just for, uh, to, to, to save time, and I'm going to have my reader to pick it up in a minute, um, uh, at the ninth verse is where you're going to pick up at, babe, at the ninth verse. You with me? You woke? You staying all up. <laughs> she knew this is her second time. She's staying up at the back there, like, oh God. Yeah. It's gonna be all right. I want you to write down some specific things. Number one, you're looking at a woman who could not bear children. You're looking at a woman who was barren. So the first place to find the miraculous is in total lack. That is the first thing, if you ever want to provoke God, don't have nothing. Don't have nothing to start with. Just, just be on zero. The greatest miracles happen. Look at Sarah, barren. Hannah, barren. Come on, somebody. Mary, empty. That's a supernatural fulfillment. So when you're looking for something that is supernatural, the first thing that has to happen is there has to be an appearance of barrenness. And there has to be a situation where it is impossible for you to work it out. It is impossible for you to fix it and anybody else that you know to fix it. Because God is not going to be in competition with your auntie and your uncle and everybody that you can borrow from. 
And so a lot of times he allows us to be put in situations so that he can, he can, he can be shown for the God that he is. Come on, somebody. We always start bugging out as soon as stuff happens. Oh God, and the devil this and the devil to know it. You're being postured to trust him. You're being, you're being put in a position for him to be proven so you can have a resume with him. You need a resume with God. And so when you go through those things and God allows, you know, you to be put in situations where your back is up against the wall and then he makes the way out of no way and he does what nobody else can do. And he did that in 1979 and he did something else in 1982 and he did something else in 1991. When you get to 2006 and you're facing something else, you have a resume. You can go back and tell the devil he did this in 86, he did this in 92, he did this in 98 and he gonna do this too. So I'm not shaking because I know God. Oh Jesus. I know him. I know him to be a, be a doctor in the sick room. A lawyer in the courtroom meal on the table that ain't just a song i know that for real so then here we have hannah and there are some particular things that postures us for the miraculous number one i said she was barren you wrote that down the next thing about her barrenness she was in uh, according to the uh, sixth verse she was embarrassed She was embarrassed. She was embarrassed because during those times, it was a shame for a woman to have a husband of any kind of prestige, especially, and you cannot bring him children. They considered you as being cursed. What you done did? What your family done did? You know, they, back then when they came down to children, they didn't just say, well, you know, what you did is, okay, you, something wrong with your whole family. You can't, there's a curse back there and something going on with y'all. And so it brought an embarrassment to the household. It brought an embarrassment to her husband. Because by the way, people start saying he's less than a man. It may not even be him. But he don't have an heir. He can't prove productivity. Oh, y'all, come on, somebody. In other words, whatever's happening in your life and whatever you got land and all of that, when a woman cannot produce and you are a person that, that owns land or whatever you are, a tent maker, they know that the end of your family lineage lies with you and your wife. You have no history in society. You won't be here long. So there's a lack of respect there. Come on somebody, I want you to see that. So you got a big old tent business and they say, well, so what? Because when you die, it's gone. You ain't got nobody to leave it to. So it was an embarrassment not to be able to have an heir. So she was embarrassed. Thank you, Jesus. It's embarrassing when you ain't got no car. Or it's embarrassing when, you know, whatever your situation is and, you know, your child is flunk in school. All these things are embarrassing. And then there's nothing worse than being embarrassed and then being provoked by somebody. Jesus. She was embarrassed and she was provoked. She was embarrassed because she didn't have an end talked about. Somebody living in your own house. Y'all ain't saying nothing. You know, back then they can have, you know, two, three, four wives and all that. Bishop and I had nobody else talking about. Yeah, I wouldn't have made it through that. I ain't that purged. <laughs> this just would have been problems. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? God knew. God knew. He, he understood that. He, he, he helped fix that thing to, you know. <laughs> they said women, in, uh, women that are in prison is, you know, the, the, the ratio is higher than men. Baby, they would have had to build some more and some more and some more. A whole lot of us be in jail right now. But you know, she was, she was provoked by this woman. You ain't got no kids and I got his baby and you ain't this and you ain't that and you ain't that and embarrassed. Mm -hmm. But the Bible said that she was embarrassed but every year, every year they went up to the temple. Every year they went up to the temple. And one day, Hannah, when she got up to the temple, she made a decision. That I'm not going to put myself in a position of, of, of getting myself out of whack 
because the only person that I can go to to bring this thing to pass is God. Because the Bible said her husband offered her stuff and he did her well. But it did not satisfy. You can have everything else. But when there is a need in your life, nothing will satisfy like that need. I don't care what you got. You can have cars, you can have houses or whatever. But if you're sick in your body and you got cancer, how is a car going to solve that? Tell somebody I'm after my need being met. So after she went up to the Lord, let's pick it up at the 10th verse. And what does he say in the 10th verse, baby? And Hannah was in distress of soul, praying to the Lord and weeping bitterly. Okay, and Hannah was in distress of soul, weeping to the Lord bitterly. She was, she was distressed in soul. Somebody said, well, 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 well the Proverbs, I'm just want God to just do this thing. You, you, you're not desperate enough for God to do it. You, you stand up there patty kicking God and thinking you all cute. And I just want you to just fix it, God. This woman was distressed. She came to prayer and wept before him sorely. She was bitterly weeping. She was, she was provoked. She was embarrassed. So when she came to prayer, she didn't come to prayer whispering to God. She came to prayer weeping bitterly before him. To the point that how do you know when you touch in heaven? You touch in heaven when other people think you're crazy. When they don't know why you get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. Why are you here at 5 a.m. in the morning? You can pray at home. You touch in God when people look at you and you're travailing in prayer and they say, what's wrong with us? You ain't got to pray all like that. Y'all sit down. It ain't that deep. Why she hollering like that? Why she drink? Why she crying so hard? I mean, you done did it. You done looked over at people and they praying. You going, God, please. Whatever it is, God, do it. She is out there. Oh, oh. She, she, she was going at it. She was going at it. She was going at it and she didn't care who was looking at her. She was going at it in front of her pastor. She was going at it so bad they thought she was drunk. Oh, y'all, we're getting somewhere with this. We're getting somewhere with this. She weeped bitterly of soul. She, she just, wow, God, just do, do this, God. And finally, Eli looked over at her. He was a temple priest and he said, you drunk? She said, I'm, I'm not... I'm, I'm not drunk. And then he said, watch this, watch this, because people, people, people need to get this. People need to get, well, you know, is you drunk? No, I'm not drunk. And he looked over at her and said, okay, you're not drunk. But whatever it is, you are coming after God for it. I speak it, that it be granted unto you. Now I want you to see that. I want you to see that. And see people, well, I can pray at home. But when it comes time for God to do something supernatural, he's got to bring you into the temple. He's got to put you in the presence of somebody that can speak it in the atmosphere prophetically. That whatever it is you're praying about, God in the name of Jesus, grant it. Y'all sit down because I'm trying to help you with my position. I'm trying to sit down. I'm trying to help you with my position. I'm not just here with a white robe on showing up. I'm trying to help you with my position. I'm here standing proxy for the temple prayer. That whatever you come in here asking God to do, my responsibility is to say, God, grant it. I don't want to get out there like that because I feel something breaking and I don't I don't I don't, I don't want to I feel something breaking y'all sit down sit down because Jesus 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 you see you see when she got to this point I want you to hear this before she got to this point I want you to see something she got to some and see and see when I say a point of desperation a desperation of weeping and and, and, and wailing and 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 and, and, and travailing but something else happened she wanted she wanted this thing to be done to the point 
I told you to point a sacrifice. I told you to point a sacrifice. See, that's the way, that's the reason why God set the Bible up to the point. Watch this. That's the reason why he set the Bible up. He set the Old Testament up that the way into the presence of the Lord. Watch this. The way into the presence of the Lord was sacrifice. Oh, come on, somebody. He said, he said, kill the lamb. Put it on the altar. When they, when, when they got ready to construct the temple, he said, out of all that you do, I want you to build me an altar. And I want there to be a continuation of slaying of what you're going to lay on the altar as a sacrifice when they laid it on the altar the bible said and the fire came from heaven and god lit the altar i want you to hear what i'm saying to you that the way into god is sacrifice and so what she did was in all of her weeping she turned around and said okay if you give me this thing i make a vow to you that i would give him back to you See, we come begging too much. God, give it to me. And the Lord is saying, there's an exchange here. You want me to do this, but where is your sacrifice? God, y'all sit down. Lord Jesus. What, 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 what are you bringing to the altar? What are you, what are you bringing as a sacrifice? When prophetess, why is, that, why is that important? Okay, let's look at Dalton Thomas. Let's look at how you believe. Let's look at how you believe. Jesus Christ was the lamb he was the living sacrifice he was the eternal sacrifice after he had paid the price of his life came back visited them in the upper room thomas was doubting he had him to walk over here to him put his finger inside of his not his cut his sacrifice oh god you didn't get that you didn't get that when he stuck his finger inside of where Jesus had made the sacrifice it caused him to believe come on somebody come on somebody see you can't believe God because you're not willing to give up anything for it oh gee you telling God to do it but you have no proof that you believe it how do I believe it because every Sunday I'm coming to the temple that's my sacrifice every Sunday morning I'm gonna get up at five o'clock I'm coming here if it kills me because this is my Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Will you? That's why you don't judge your praise by your neighbor. Because your neighbor don't know what you're looking for. Okay. What your neighbor needs from God is a thank you, Jesus. Yours may be, Lord, I got to get on the floor. Your neighbors may be, hallelujah. Yours may be, I got to howl out of my spirit until I feel the breakthrough. I told you, if there is no sacrifice, there is no attention. You don't get attention from God just by, oh, I just thank you God. Sacrifice, that's what he recognizes. That's when Jesus got all power, when he sacrificed. That's when he got authority in hell, when he sacrificed. And see, that's the age we living in. Gimme, 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 gimme. No sacrifice. You ask people to speak the flow, how much you gonna pay me? Take the church garbage out, how much you gonna pay me? Will you clean the bathroom, how much you gonna pay me? Y'all ain't saying that. Will you welcome the women's conference, can I have a free pass? David said, I don't want this floor for free. Cause what's gonna be built on this floor is gonna be an eternal statue for the people of God. So I can't say nobody gave it to me. Because see, when you say somebody gave it to you, then they gonna want the glory. And they gonna keep back wanting to make you pay for what they did for you. You don't hear what I'm saying? That's why God is requiring that we offer him a sacrifice. Because when God did it, nobody gets the glory but God. Y'all sit down, just sit, sit down. Let me, just, let me just do this, let me do this, let me do this, let me do this. Let me do this, let me do this, let me do this. She made a vow. She said, God, give me this son. Give it to me. She said, because if you give me this son, I will dedicate him to the temple. And he will serve at the temple as long as he lives. Now, I, I want you to see, see you, you, y'all, you, turn to the second chapter because I want you to see something. I want you to see something. I want you to turn to the second chapter, and, and, and sweetheart, I want, you to, I want you to pick it up at uh, the 12th verse for me right quick. The 12th verse, 2 and, and 12, 
Pick that up. Read that. The sons of Eli Come on. were base and worthless. A little bit more. Come on. They did not know or regard the Lord. Okay. The sons of Eli in the same temple were worthless. They did not regard the laws of God. They did not regard the presence of God. Read. I want to show you something real powerful. Your 13th verse. Come on, baby. And the custom of the priests uh -huh. with the people was this. Mm -hmm. When any man offered sacrifice, uh -huh. the priest's servant came while the flesh was boiling with a flesh hook of three prongs in his hand. Read it. And he thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook broke, brought up, the priest took for himself. Okay, read it. So they did in Shiloh with all the Israelites who came there. Read it. Also, before they burned the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man who sacrificed, Give the priest meat to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you but raw. Okay, now watch this. I want you, some of y'all said, well, what does that got to do with us today? What does that have to do with us in prayer? Because when they came to the temple to offer sacrifice, <laughs> They would bring their living sacrifice, lay it on the altar, and it was the responsibility and it was the duty and the right of the priest. Of the priest. Let me bring it so you can understand it. Not me in this place. Jesus Christ, the high priest. It was his job, his responsibility, his duty to walk up to the sacrifice while it was on the altar, scoop up, and however much came up of what you laid down, he kept it. You didn't hear me. Now I got to let you pause for that one. Because you're going to have to think about that for a minute. What, 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 okay, I don't, I don't get it, prophets. Okay, when you, come to the, when you come to the temple and you make your sacrifice, however much the priest would scoop up on the hook and take, he keeps it. He didn't want pre-sacrificed meat. He wanted it raw. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm going to help you with this. I'm going to help you with this. He said, whatever you would put on the altar and sacrifice, the priest would scoop it up. And that's the part he would keep. Well, 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 well how does this relate to us? Because the Bible tells us in the book of Romans that we are to present bodies as a living sacrifice which means when you come into the temple prayer and you put yourself on the altar you got to put all of it up there row and whatever God scoops up and say this is what I want to keep okay sit down sit down sit down sit down because you got to get this you got to get this that's why you can't walk up to God and when you come in to bring a sacrifice it's not your money that he wants when he calls you to 5 a.m. prayer when he sets your life up where you need a miracle it is God saying the reason why you are in the position that you are in and you need this miracle because I'm looking for a greater sacrifice I'm tired of you just coming to church praising me get your body put it on this altar and whatever I choose to use Mom, this gonna take you down. See, you can't, you can't, you can't walk with the God and just say, "I give you my hands." You know, everybody put everything up there but something. I'm talking right now. I'm talking to the Holy Ghost right now. You said everything on the altar but something. You know, everybody got that thing that they don't want to give God. Everybody got that thing about them that they don't want to give up. Oh, I told her, oh, I can't help it. That's my temper. That's what he wants. Oh, I, I cussed her out and I didn't mean it, but you know that's just me. No. stuck right there when I start preaching like that he said he said raw and and no 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 this gonna get you this gonna get you this gonna he said, and whatever what whatever the priest the priest scoops up this is the part that I that I keep and that's why when you really present your body a living sacrifice there's some things you can't go back to when you really present your body a living sacrifice See, 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 you can look at people and tell when people sing, 
and when they being drawn to sacrifice. Like when you look at Sister Pat, you can tell Sister Pat ain't singing because I just love to sing. No one day she put herself on the altar and the Lord said, that's the part I want. I want that to be dedicated to me. I don't want you to go and make a secular record. I want that right there. Are you hearing what I'm talking about? And what the Lord will require out of you is your best. He'll come up with the very thing that you prize and possess. The old Jesus. We willing to give God the leftovers, but God wants you to give to him what you gave the devil. You partied all night long when I wasn't saved. I went to the disco and didn't leave till four in the morning. And now when God said, come at 5 a.m., I act like I got a problem with it. No, that's what God wants. He wants what you gave to the devil. And he wanted the way you gave it to the devil. You didn't complain when you were smoking, cracking cigarettes and hopping bars and jumping in the bed with everybody. So he said, when I call you to 5 a.m., don't complain now. Sit down, I gotta, I gotta do this. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We want to give him something easy. You want to give him something that don't cost you nothing. You want to give him something that don't require tears. Okay, but let me tell you how he feel about that. Let me read this to you. Because see, I gotta have enough, I gotta have enough force to read this. He said, he said in the 16th verse, and if the man said to him, let them burn the fat first, and then you may take as much as you want. The priest servant would say, no, give it to me now, or I will take it by force. See, you think your car accident was the devil. When he asked you for a sacrifice and you didn't bring it, he said, now I got to take it by force. Y'all sit down. Y'all sit down. Sit down right there. Sit down right there. Sit down. Sit down. Uh Uh-uh, I told you to pray. And you didn't want to pray. Now your baby's sick. Now I got to take it by force. I told you to pay your tithes. You wouldn't pay them. So now I got to mess your finances up because I got to take it by force. You don't hear what I'm saying. I told you that I wanted you to offer yourself as a sacrifice. That's why now there's trouble in your home, trouble in your marriage because now I got to take it. Sit down. You got to think about that for a minute. I got to take it now. You wouldn't just bring yourself to me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You want to get up before you go to work and just give me a few minutes while you're putting on your makeup and call that prayer. Oh, I'm not here nobody talk to me. I'm not here nobody talk to me. Oh, you want to get in your car and drive and on your way to work while you're thinking about everything else, you call yourself praying with your little tape on? I told you to set aside a time of prayer. I called you to 5 a.m. prayer on Sundays. Don't ask me how long. You don't want to come? I know how to take it. you in a position that you ain't got no other choice but to talk to me I know how to allow allow the enemy to make you feel like you about to lose your mind so you will find out that I am your peace I know how to strip you down of everything you got until you have to come to me just for your next meal don't make me take it by force y'all said that Okay, why am I saying all this? Why is the Lord giving all this? Because, because the temple service and the prayer in the temple and the glory of God and the presence of God in the temple is not matching the Old Testament yet. Because they weren't in the servant because they was in trouble. Oh, Jesus. 
they weren't laying sacrifices down because everything was messed up it was a joy in their soul and a commitment in their heart that I'm serving in the temple because I love God and see that's what's wrong with the church now that's why the God can't get the glory and that's why the glory can't be revealed the way God would desire it to because everybody in here messed up everybody in here got issues God is waiting for somebody to put your issues on the altar and somebody to come into his presence and intercede for the nation because they have presented their body a living sacrifice and I'm not in prayer for my issues oh you don't hear what I'm saying I got problems but that's not why I'm in prayer I got some things that I need God to work out but that's not the reason why I come I got some bills that I need God to pay but that's not why I'm here I'm here because I'm presenting my body a living sacrifice Jesus Lord have mercy see sit down and I'm finished there's a different kind of weight of glory that uh okay have you just had some friends and uh because everybody got several friends if you don't have no friends I'm telling you right now the problem is you okay All right. I ain't got no friends. I don't need no friends. You got some issues. And can't nobody stand you. So just let's just settle that right now. Because everybody ought to have at least one or two friends. Friends ain't perfect. You got to have one or two friends. Some of them got to be good friends and some of them got to be friends with issues. And then you know they got issues. And, and it's all right, but it's the other part of them that you like. And then when they start tripping, you just don't call and you let them go through cycles y'all didn't know that friends go through cycles and y'all she going through that thing right there and after a while two three days she called you like ain't nothing happened and you act like ain't nothing happened hey how you doing Thank you. I'm going tomorrow yeah how you been then everybody say you know I've been busy you know whenever somebody tell you I ain't called you in a while because I've been busy that means I've been tripping so don't read it just read the real thing into it <laughs> I've been messed up in my mind, the devil been talking to me and I've been tricked for about three days, but I'm back now. I've just been busy. <laughs> so, so how would you like it if you had friends, <laughs> if, if all your friends was just needy? Give me a dollar, give me a quarter, take me to lunch, give me some pizza, give me a ride, let me borrow your dress, let me borrow your, oh, get my hair done for me, give me nails done for me. <laughs> this your friend. How much time would you spend with it? Okay. That's the point I'm trying to make right there. What kind of friend are you to God? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Because see, there's some other friends that they don't want nothing from you. They don't need nothing from you. All they want to do, they want the relationship. See, I got some friends that don't want my money. They don't want to ride in my car. They don't want to come to my house. They just want the relationship. They just want to be every now and then. And you know what? I can go six months without talking to them. But every time I talk to them, it's just like I talked to them yesterday. Because when they don't need anything from me physically, and they just want the relationship, there's something about my spirit that opens up to them. Who am I preaching to today? That's the place God's trying to get us to in this house. Well, God, we're not coming because we need something. We come in because we love you. We come in because we're looking for what's on your heart. We want you, according to the book of Ezekiel, to give us your burden. What is it, God, that you're weeping about? What is it that's got you burning? Help us to pick up the assignment and know what your heart is. Because we just want the relationship. Oh, Jesus. Sit down, y'all, because, because let me just help you with something. Oh, God, can I, am I helping anybody today? Am I helping anybody today? See, I'm helping your prayer life right now. I'm helping your prayer life because some of us don't talk to God till we need something. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God, we're getting somewhere today. See, I just, I just want to be in your presence. When I come into my prayer room, the people came the other day to do an interview with me for, uh, for uh, Upscale Magazine. 
and uh, they wanted me on the the, uh, the, the, the the cover of the August edition. So the lady came, the people came to my house and they was interviewing me and they were just talking. Da, 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 da. And so I kept on saying, you know, yeah, and prayer and la da, da, da. And she said, well, how did you, you know, get to da da da? And I said, you know, prayer da da. Well, I, I read here where you used to be on welfare da da. Well, how did you? I said, well, prayer da da. And so she, she, I guess I just started irritating a little bit. So about a half hour through the interview, she said, well, the people that's gonna read this, a lot of them are just not Christian. How would you kind of fix this so that you can reach them? I said, Jesus. I said, let me get this clear. Before we even finish this interview, I'm not the down the middle of the person. I had a nervous breakdown, I've been on welfare, I've been broke, I've been busted, I've been divorced. You don't hear what I'm saying? I've been abused and I'm not getting ready to get all the way here and act like it's a higher power that got me here. And act like it's crystal balls and all you gotta do is have a 12 step program. It was Jesus, now quote me. Okay, okay. Jesus. Okay, sit down. Sit down. Living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. So they kept talking, and we kept talking about prayer, and we kept talking, we kept talking, and so finally one of the girls said, "Well, can we, um, can we see your prayer room?" I said, "I said, yeah, you can see my prayer room. You know, we get through the interview." We'll see. Because see, my prayer room is not filled with, Lord, I need you. Lord, I want you. Lord, do it. God, fix it. God, work it out. God, you. I step in that room and I say, Father, I love you so much. See, your presence is so strong in it. I love you so much. I pick up the assignment. I pick it up. And then if there's... If there's somebody in my family he wants me to pray for, he gives me that as, a, as an assignment. I'm not just in there as a whining cow. Oh God, and touch Uzi, and touch Gabby, and God do it for Winky, and God do it for the... Father, what is my son? Because what I have done is I have, I have aligned my whole family with the heart of God. So they don't take precedent over what the burden of the Lord is. It's all in the same power. So whatever you pick out that day, God, that's what I pray. See, a lot of y'all ain't got that yet. A lot of y'all ain't got that because you're too desperate. And you're desperate because you don't trust God. You're desperate because you don't understand that you are the royal diadem according to the book of Psalms in your family that the Lord has called to stand proxy. You don't even understand that the very fact that you are alive, there's some stuff the devil can't do to your family, especially when you're committed to prayer. Sit down. Let me make this clear. Let me make something clear. Let me make this clear. When, you're, when you present your body as a living sacrifice and your body now represents the office of intercession, your spirit is in intercession. It intercedes on your behalf. You don't hear me? Which means I don't have to put focus on my issues. My spirit is interceding for my issues. I am in the presence of God to pick up his assignment while the spirit of the Lord make an intercession for me. Sit down because that's too much for you. Remember when I, when I said, um, when the book of Ephesians talk about the spirit of God and Ephesians 1 and 17, how we are here to receive things from God. It talks about the manifold wisdom of God. And when I look at the word manifold, manifold wisdom of God says it is, it is one substance with many and multiple compartments. It is, it is one substance with many and multiple 
compartments, watch this, with many forms and features. That's what manifold mean. So when we pick up, when I said in Ephesians 1, how a spirit, the spirit of God, <laughs> maketh intercession for you. He does not make intercession for you in retardation. He is making intercession for you with his manifold wisdom which means there are different compartments that are going on to what the spirit of God is doing he's never doing one thing and when he calls you to pray you are praying about stuff in your family that has not even happened yet when you are in tongues and you don't even know it because the manifold wisdom of God takes over in prayer I know you can't say amen sit down because you didn't you, I, I, I know that's why the devil don't want you to pray and that's why he don't want you to tap the realm of praying in tongues because when that happens the manifold take place it's like you saying father god i thank you and i love you and i praise you that's centered that's centered that's intelligence that's intellect that's human know-how so so that's going father god i thank you i praise you for your goodness i praise you for all that you've done but the minute you start that thing it branches off in so many different areas because at that time the spirit of the lord has opened up a window and it gets the job done you don't hear me when he calls you to prayer it's because he opens up a window in the spirit and when you make intercession multiple things are happening for your family for your mind for your spirit for your loved ones for your finances for your church for the world for the nation for your city all at the same time in one prayer I'm, 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 I'm teaching too hard because when y'all start giving me that look like oh Jesus oh Jesus it says close with this that the woman prayed continually continually and then she offered up a sacrifice let me tell you something the Bible said she prayed and she was provoked year after year after year after year so I said I prayed and I just been praying for six months and ain't nothing changed year after year after year won't you see something see I'm trying to help you I know people tell you this all the time I'm just how many want to know how to get a 24 hour miracle? I know all that sounds so, and it just become jargon. But I want you to see a woman that prayed year after year after year, and it wasn't until she made the vow. <laughs> wasn't until she mentioned her sacrifice. Like she praying and the Lord is just, she weeping. He, she wailing and he's and she said but I vow and he said hold it what what'd you say I, I vow to bring you who a sacrifice okay you got it okay you got the secret my grandmother used to make cakes and uh, she wouldn't let nobody in the kitchen when she made cakes. But my grandmother, she didn't make cakes all the time. When she made them, you know, I know y'all think we just weird and strange. But my grandma be in there just speaking in tongues and having church. <laughs> and everybody started reminding them so much of grandma because my grandmother wore high heels every day. She vacuumed and everything with high heels. Every day. Every day. I'm the only one in my family that do that. Can preach in high heels. My grandmother wore high heels every day. She cleaned in high heels. Black patent leather high heels. I never forget that. And so my grandmother would be in there making these cakes. And um, she would just be in her own world. And so when my grandmother make a cake, the cake would be so 
good, but there was just something. It's just a thing with our family. Just trust me. So one day, my god brother, who was a straight backslider, you know, just in the streets, just smoking weed and everything, he came by the house. And grandma's cake was on the counter. And he said, who made this cake? So he had gotten high and he was having one of his moments. Everybody said, Big Mom made that cake. He got him a slice. He stood the counter. He ate it. He came back over the counter and got him another slice. So one of my sisters said, you just going to eat up all the cake. He said, this cake is sitting here. He came back and got a third slice. We were all sitting around the kitchen talking. And all of a sudden, bam! He hits the floor. Pass out coat. We ran and got mama because she was downstairs washing clothes. And I said, Edward done fell out. I, I think something happened. We better call that. By the time my mother hit the top steps, he was speaking in tongues. He got saved that night by eating a piece of cake that had a secret ingredient. Okay, you don't hear me. You don't hear me. See, you can do a whole lot of praying. You can do a whole lot of hollering. But you ain't going nowhere until you get the secret ingredients. And today, it's called sacrifice. Today, it's how much are you willing to give up for God for it? See, I got some people looking at me now say, looking like, I don't know. Some of y'all looking like, I think Emma gonna have to go and be with the Lord because I thought I wanted her to get healed. But what Prophet's talking about today, this woman said, I'm gonna give him to you. Mm -hmm. The next year when her husband went up to the temple, he said, baby, you're going? She said, no. Now, now, listen, sit down. You gotta get this because I got, I got five minutes to tell you this. He said, we're going up to the temple. His baby was born. He said, you going? She said, no, I'm not going this year. He said, well, when are you going? She said, I can't go and bring him until I have weaned him from me. It ain't no real sacrifice until you give it to God and don't regret it. See, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> until you wean your time from you, until all of a sudden you, you, you take pleasure in giving it to God, that you know what, you don't need an alarm clock, your eyes just automatically open up at four o'clock, because you know you gotta be somewhere, who am I talking to, see, it ain't a real sacrifice until it's weaned from you, come on somebody, until now you look at it and say, I know this don't belong to me, this belong to God, so let me start now cutting this from me. I'm not hearing nobody preach to me right there. I'm not hearing nobody preach to me right there. Y'all sit down because y'all, y'all, y'all stuck now. Because I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some of y'all faces looking at me like. Till, till, it's not, it's not, it's not a sacrifice until you prefer God have it than you. Until you keep asking him, do we want it? I, I, who am I talking to? See, it ain't no sacrifice until you don't care. Until everybody else looking at you and say. I, you, you, I don't know, honey. I don't know how you do. It's okay because it's my, it's my, it's my sacrifice. You know, I, I, I told that lady that was interviewing me. I said, people, honey, been talking about me for years. You know, and she preaching and she wear white robes and she did. I said, yep. I said, but I start out, I start out praying. She always praying. She always talking about praying. She always talking about the tabernacle. She always talking about the ark of the covenant. But I kept on. I kept on. You know, when I had a nervous breakdown, I was talking about the tabernacle. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. When I was on welfare, I was still praying. Come on, somebody. And I done prayed my way all the way up all over the world while they still talking. You don't hear what I'm saying. See, it ain't a sacrifice until you're willing to ignore what people think about what you give it. And that's what's wrong with some of y'all. That's why you can't tap the realm in God that you're supposed to tap because you're too busy being concerned about what people think about what you are called to do for God. A secret the greater the sacrifice the greater the blessing if you want to know what you got coming from God you don't need a prophet to tell you look at your sacrifice I, I gotta quit right there I gotta quit right there sit down I gotta quit right there right there I gotta stop I gotta stop
You don't need no prophet. You need anybody to tell you, honey, I see the Lord told me to tell you that he getting ready to really bless you. Mm -mm. You, want, you want to really know? Measure. Measure your sacrifice. Jesus gave his life. You don't hear me. That's why he can command life because he gave a life. So you, 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 you want to know how to get what you need? <laughs> what did you give up? You want wealth? You give money. What did you give up? How much? How much you sacrifice? I'm not hearing nobody talk to me. I don't hear nobody talk to me. You want an anointing? How much of your flesh are you willing to surrender? Because it's going to cost you some. Let me make an announcement. Salvation is free. All the rest of that stuff, you pay for it. And the anointing and power and authority is expensive. It ain't cheap, baby. This ain't the one where you talk and come for five minutes and think you got it. This one requires that you give it all up your mind, your soul, your body, your eyes. You set no evil thing before your eyes. You let nothing wrong come out of your mouth. You keep your heart pure. You keep your hands clean. That's when you have power with God and authority over the devil because that's what you sacrificed. Sit down, I'm finished. Jesus. She said, why do you think, let me just help you with this. I've been, I've been working on this for some weeks. Pastor Hogan, I told the people, I said, God wants me in this house to develop the 5 a.m. prayer for the spirit of the Levites. Why do you think the Bible said that give this, drive this, give that, drive that, give them this, give that, but to the Levites? I am their portion. Why? I am their portion because they have to give me their life. Okay, you don't hear me. They don't work in the field. They work the temple. <laughs> they don't wear what they want to wear. They wear a garment that I have designed for them. And the Bible said in the book of Deuteronomy that they would wear it perpetually when those that would see them would know that they were of the Levitical priesthood. I'm not hearing y'all talk to me. I'm not hearing y'all talk to me right there. See, it's done got quiet all the way in the back. Even down to their children. <laughs> their children had to wear the same garment. You don't hear what I'm saying to you. The whole family had to be dedicated. The wife couldn't be in the street working in another tribe. Everything about their household had to be a dedication to the temple. Who am I talking to right here? And that's why the Lord said, I am their portion. Which means they will never want for anything else. They don't have to pray and ask me for stuff in the temple. Because they sacrifice their life to the temple. I will give them all that they need exceedingly abundantly above all they can ask or think <laughs> sit down because I'm not supposed to really take y'all out there like that now we was in revival we would be here for about two more hours hollering like we crazy my God. Did you get that point? When you, when you present the body to the service of the temple, to the office of the intercession of the tabernacle, then you need not come begging. God, I need to eat. God, my family. God, my rent. God, my lights. It's taken care of because of the office that you saw. Let me just help you with that. When you come to that place, and I'm not preaching something somebody told me. I'm talking what I know. When you come to that place, everything becomes secondary. Yes. Baby, I didn't have my life turned out before. I didn't ask God to pray. I didn't pray and told the Lord to pay my bill. He didn't pay it. I got some candles. Kept on reading. Got everything I need to get in the daytime. 
when nighttime came, had my candles, and had the nerve to invite people over. We sitting there in the dark with candles playing Uno. Because he was teaching me then that this is the will of God concerning me. That all things work together for the good to them that love the Lord, to them that are called to, according to his purposes. And what he was trying to show me is when you make lights and gas and rent and car notes and all that, those your priority. And then your whole spirit get jacked out of shape when they turn your phone off. God can't even hear from you. You mad, you disappointed. Y'all, come on somebody. I'm trying to get you somewhere. I'm trying to get you where the cares of life don't keep snatching you out of the presence of God. I'm trying to get you to the place that you finally tell the devil, if he take everything I got, whatever you take, don't take your spirit from me. You can have my car, you can have my house, you can turn my lights off. I don't need a phone as long as I can reach you. phone on this week phone off it's all right come on somebody come on here church come on here church I thought you had, so I said I thought you had a car I did for six months where's it at I ain't got no more but how you feel blessed because apparently he walked me on the bus stop and I'm not going to sit on the bus stop with an attitude. Come on, y'all stress too much. Sit down, somebody. Sit down. We stress too much. We stress too much. Because the Bible talks about that. He talks about that. In the book of St. Luke, when he started talking about the seed and the sower, he said, that's why you, you got to be careful. Because your spirit is a, is a ground. It's a campground for the will of God and the word of God. And it says that, that, that woe unto them. That, that, that keeps getting carried away by the cares of this world. By the cares of life. Honey, I was on welfare and kept praying. Come on, somebody. I didn't have no food, but I kept praying. I came to church and shouted like everybody else did. Because God was training my spirit how to put my trust in him. He was training my spirit that where I am now is only my process. This is not my destiny. So I begin to praise him in destiny. Can I prove it to you? Can I prove it to you before Bishop comes? Let me prove it to you. Scripturally. I'm not going to even go back to the, turn back to the Bible. But the Bible said when that woman came to the temple and she prayed. And Eli said, whatever you're praying for, I grant it to you. The Bible said then she started praising God. She wasn't pregnant. She hadn't even made it back home yet. Oh, come on, somebody. Her and her husband hadn't even got together yet. But she started praising God. She stopped praising God at the man of God's word in the tabernacle. She got a word from the temple during her time of intercession. And she started praising God because she knew he was on the way. Who am I preaching to today? That's where he's trying to get you to. You may not have no money right now, but you praise him because you have already made intercession for him. Because today, God wants a hand of praise. They didn't have no organ back then. I'm not hearing y'all talk back to me. What no drums in the temple? How many did you shout ya? Just the praise going up out of her spirit. Today, you gotta give him a praise. You gotta give him a praise that says, it's well with my soul. You gotta give him a praise that says, I know what you are doing. I trust you, God. Open up your mouth and give it to him right now. of where you're trying to go. Get a vision of what it is you want. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Give him a sacrifice of praise. David said, I will offer up a sacrifice of praise. It's the sacrifice that gets God's attention. Praise him.
Keep praising. Come on, he birthing something in you. He birthing a new order in you. He birthing a new form of praise. He birthing a temple praise. A temple praise. A hand of praise. A praise that says, I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. Switch over. You can switch your 